Welcome to the Transformation Church Podcast, where we're leading people into a transforming relationship with Jesus. We hope this message inspires you, builds your faith, and gives you a fresh perspective on God and His Word so you can see transformation in your own life. Enjoy the message. Today we are, as you saw, we're kicking off a new series that I'm gonna get into here in just a moment called Summer on the Mount. But before I do that, just wanna say uh, hello to those that might be visiting with us for the first time or maybe you're watching uh, online today. My name's Ryan, have the honor of serving alongside my wife, Andrea, as lead pastor here. And uh, if you're looking for a church home, trying to find the right fit, uh, look no further. I tell you, this is the best church that I've ever been a part of. And... Um, I would attend this place even if I didn't uh, work at this place. I mean, it's just awesome. And I'm sure you'll feel the same way um, if you'll hang around for a little bit. And so I just want to say again, welcome home. Uh, As we jump in today in uh, week one, I want to ask you a little question. Have you ever ever looked forward to something and uh, you kind of built up your hopes, You, 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 uh, you wanted it so badly, but then when you got it, it didn't quite turn out the way you thought it would. Have you ever had that? Like, like maybe as a kid, like looking forward to Christmas and getting a certain toy and then that didn't work out. Or as you get older, like looking forward to some things and it just didn't quite work out the way that you thought it would work out. Um, I've been on a, a health journey. I mentioned that a few weeks back. Um, but for me, one of the things that, um, that I love that I don't get to really do a whole lot of anymore is eat French fries. Like, that's like one of my guilty pleasures, I guess, eating some French fries. And, um, and my favorite, I'm not going to take a poll today, but I think the best French fries is from this place called McDonald's. And um, I specifically picked this picture because I was hoping some of you would have nightmares tonight. Isn't that, isn't that a freaky picture? But McDonald's, I love me some McDonald's French fries. And... Um, When I go through the drive-thru and I just can't fight the temptation anymore and uh, end up going through the drive-thru to get some french fries, uh, there's two things that that I expect. Two things that I expect from the french fries when I go through the drive-thru line. The first one is when I pull out of the drive-thru onto the road and I put my hand down into that bag of french fries, I expect for my French fries to be hot, right? I want some hot French fries. The second thing that I expect, because there is nothing worse than cold or hot French fries, but you put that thing in your mouth and it's not salted, right? Like I want hot French fries and I want them salted. And, um, and when that doesn't happen, I get irritated. I don't know about you, but when, when you're going to waste some calories on some French fries, like you want those things to be hot, you want them to be salted, you've got this like, you're kind of thinking about what this moment is going to be, the moment it touches your lips and it burns a little bit, but you feel the salt. It's just this moment that you expect and when it doesn't happen, I get irritated get a little disappointed, right? Like I either have to make one of two choices. Either I don't eat them or I waste my calories on fries that I don't even like. You see, in life, I think it could be a lot like that. I think that in life, there's some things that we kind of build up in our mind that we assume will make us happy in life, and when they don't quite work the way that we thought they would, we get a little disappointed, get a little irritated. Like maybe for some of you today, you, for you, you kind of built up this idea of if I just get this degree in school that, um, that life will go a certain way, or maybe you're a high school student today and And for you, you're thinking like next level sports. Like if I can just get to the next level and play basketball or football, that I'll be, I'll be happy. Or maybe for some of you today, it's, it's money. Like if you could just have a few extra zeros after your annual income, that you'll be 
You'll be happy. Maybe it's for you, it's a, a job. Maybe for you, it's to have a certain car or a boat or that house with the pool in the back. Or maybe for somebody today, you're thinking like, man, I just want to get married. If I could get married, I'll be happy. Or for some of you married couples, you're thinking like um, having kids. If I could just, if I could have kids, I can't wait till I have kids. I'm just going to be fulfilled and happy. For some of you, you walked in the day and you're like, if I could just lose like 10 pounds, like 10 pounds, Ryan, I'll be, I'll be happy. Or maybe for some of you, it's like, if I could just if I could just change states, like if I could just get anywhere other than where I'm living or a new job, or maybe, maybe for you, you're a young adult and you're thinking, if I could just get out of my parents' house, right? If I could just move out and get on my own, that I would just be, I would just be happy. And, and at some point along the way in life, um, you and I get whatever those things are that we aspire to and Sooner or later, we end up discovering that happiness isn't found in those things. And when we discover that, we get, we get a little irritated. We get a little disappointed. And today, I want to spend our time together, and I want, to, I want to help you see how you can keep that from happening, how you can keep from, from having this desire of these things in life that are going to lead to happiness to then find out on the other end that that they don't really lead to happiness. Today, we're kicking off uh, this new series, Summer on the Mount, uh, where we're gonna be uh, going on a journey over the next couple months, um, looking at uh, what is called Sermon on the Mount uh, in Matthew chapter five through seven. And we're gonna be unpacking some of the big ideas. We don't have time to go into all the big ideas, but we're gonna unpack some of the big ideas that are found in these few chapters that Jesus shares. And uh, today I wanna focus on Matthew chapter five, verse one through 12. And here's the title that I wanna talk about today. Choose the Jesus way. Turn to two people, say, choose the Jesus way. Choose the Jesus way. So let let me set the scene a little bit for the Sermon on the Mount. Here we've got Jesus, and uh, he's almost two years into his public ministry. And I mean, this guy is creating chaos everywhere. Like everybody is thinking that Jesus is there to save them from Roman oppression. He's there to bring the kingdom of God, right? And, and one of the reasons why there's such chaos everywhere is that Jesus is walking around, it says in Matthew chapter four, he's walking around and he's healing everybody. Like, could you imagine that? Like, like I mean, somebody just walking into all the hospitals, like the side of the road, just everybody touches. Like, they're all, they're just being healed. It says he's casting out demons. I mean, he is just creating chaos everywhere. And uh, in essence, like you would kind of imagine that in today's terms, like Jesus is going viral. Like, I mean, his influence, his fame, his notoriety, like all of this stuff, Jesus is just creating mass chaos. And, and as he begins to do that, people began to follow. Huge crowds began to follow. And in these crowds are not just people that want to be followers of Jesus. In these crowds are are people that are there to see the signs and wonders, people that um, are there just to see what what they can get out of Jesus, if Jesus can make their life better. In the crowds, or they've got to be some, some people with political agendas, right? Trying to maneuver their way to find out what Jesus is doing in order to try to hold him accountable or to get leverage. Like, like, and then you've got some genuine people that are, are really turning their life over to Jesus. And you've got this, like, this crowd full of all of these different People And in Matthew chapter five, Jesus has this moment where as the crowds began to to gather and they're following him around, that he stops along this hillside. I got a picture of of that hillside where it is um, thought to, uh, the Sermon on the Mount thought to have happened. And, And I want you to visualize 
This moment we see in Matthew chapter five, verses one through two, that, that it says that one day that Jesus sees the crowds that are gathering around and Jesus went up on the mountainside. He began to kind of climb up the, the, the hill there. And it says in verse one that he sits down. Now, what's interesting about this phrase of him sitting down is that culturally in those days is like completely opposite than these days. Like in those days, teachers, rabbis would stand up and they would have conversations that when they stood up was more of a like friend to friend kind of conversation. When they would sit down more times than not, that was when they were trying to get undivided attention. Like think about, think about moments that you might sit down with a friend and have just a heart to heart kind of conversation. That's what the culture was like in those days. And so in this moment with all of these crowds surrounding, Jesus sits down on the side of the hill and, and it says that his disciples end up kind of coming up and gathering around him. And, and it says in verse two that Jesus began to teach. Now, I know we say this phrase, Sermon on the Mount, but it's really more kind of like teaching in a small group. Like Jesus is sitting there with his disciples and there's lots of people that are gathered around, but he's not up there with a headset microphone. He's not up there like, like a megaphone. He's sitting on the side of a hill, having a conversation, teaching with his disciples. And the reason why understanding who is around him in the moment is so important is because with the disciples around him, what Jesus is about to say, what we're going to unpack is not a path to salvation because these disciples are already following him. What Jesus is about to share with these disciples is more of a path to happiness and fulfillment in life. Here's what Jesus says, starting in verse three. He says, God blesses those. And I wanna, I wanna stop here because this word bless is mentioned nine times in the next 10 verses. And if we don't understand what this word bless means, then we're gonna miss, completely miss Jesus's point from this text. You see, in the Greek language, this word bless is the word makarios, and it actually means happiness. But it's not the kind of happiness that you and I would, would, would associate with that. It's a much deeper kind of happiness. You see, the Greek word for the word blessed that is used here, makarios, was an actual name of an island that was outside the coast of Greece at that time. And here's what's really cool about, about this is that that island was called the Blessed Island. And here's, here's the reason why it was called the Blessed Island. Because residents never had to go anywhere else because every resource they needed was already on the island. Isn't that cool? So... This idea of makarios of, of happiness is not a happiness like we would associate in the English language as far as being an emotion that we feel like if we get a good grade in school or if our team wins. It's the kind of happiness that becomes like a state of, of being. It's a happiness because we recognize how fortunate we are that everything that we need to thrive in life comes only from Jesus. And so Jesus has this moment with the disciples and they're associating that when he says, when he uses this word bless, and then he mentions eight heart postures. These aren't eight commandments. These are eight, Jesus giving eight heart postures that if you want to have that kind of life, a happiness, a, a fortunate life, a kind of life that, that is going to bring fulfillment, true happiness, that it only comes on my island, right? It only comes on the Jesus way island. And here's what, 
what he says. He gives these um, eight different things. He says in verse three that God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. So in essence, what Jesus is saying here is the first of the heart postures that you and I need in order to experience the blessing that he's talking about. And here's what that point is, is blessed are those who live as though everything they have comes from God. Blessed are those who live as though everything they have comes from God. You know, this is a heart posture that oftentimes over time, as followers of Christ, um, it begins to kind of dwindle. That as we begin to walk the path of following Jesus, we become more and more disconnected from the fact that everything that we have is from him. Like everything that I am, everything that I have, a mindset of that comes from Jesus. Like without Jesus, Ryan is lost. Without Jesus, Ryan is angry. I'm, I'm addicted to things that I don't need to be addicted to. Without Jesus, Ryan is selfish. But with Jesus, Ryan is happy, is fulfilled, has a happy marriage of 25 years, has three beautiful kids that love Jesus and are following Jesus, that is living a life that's on purpose, that's making a difference. It doesn't mean my life is perfect or that I'm without difficulty. It means that my life isn't dictated by the outside surroundings, that there is a stability of happiness and fulfillment that only comes from Jesus. You see, Jesus in this moment, he's not speaking of a financial poverty. He's speaking of a a poverty of the soul, spiritually recognizing that everything we have belongs to him. Friend, we've got to come to a place in our life where we recognize that it's impossible to be filled with God's blessing when we are full of ourselves when we're full of the things that we crave and that we want in life and Jesus is having this moment, listen, if you want true happiness, you've got to recognize that everything you are and everything you have comes from the Father. The second thing that he mentions is in verse four. He said, God blesses those who mourn for they will be comforted. In order, what Jesus is saying is that blessed are those who are broken over sin. He's not talking about people that just kind of walk around crying all the time. He's he's using this word mourn, which all of us understand that this word mourn is different than crying. It is an emotion that takes complete control over our body, right? Right? Like there was a season when my mom passed away that I, I thought that I would be okay, but then uncontrollably at random moments, I would, I would end up mourning. I would end up crying uncontrollably for two or three or four minutes, mourning over all that I had missed out on in my life because my mom chose a different path, a different way in life. And Jesus is talking about this idea of mourning and he's saying, listen, that if you want to live the Jesus way, if you want to have the kind of happiness and fulfillment that is despite all the other stuff that's happening around you in life, that you've got to have this heart posture that is broken over sin. And I want to ask you a question that's kind of a heavy question this morning, but When was the last time that you sinned? I'm not talking about mistake. I'm talking about you, you sinned. Like you did something that was shameful, something that you're embarrassed to even talk about, something that you know was wrong and you were broken over it. Or when was the last time that you looked at the world in which we live in and 
And instead of pointing fingers and blaming other people, you were genuinely broken for the sin of our country. Like Jesus is saying, if we're gonna if we're gonna have this kind of happiness and fulfillment in life, there's gotta be this position of the heart where we quit making excuses about our own sin, we quit pointing fingers at, at other people, but we genuinely have a broken heart for the sinfulness in our lives and around us. Friend, I think the most dangerous place that we can be as Christians is to become emotionally detached from the stain and the significance of the sin in our life. And Jesus is calling out in this moment, there's got to be a a brokenness over the choices that you make. He says in verse three, or not verse three, verse five, then the third one, that God blesses those who are humble for they will inherit the whole earth. Jesus is saying here, blessed are those who display strength under control. See, this word humble in the original language has nothing to do with weakness or timidity. It means strength under control. Aristotle actually defined this word as steady courage. See, in the Bible, the word humble in the original language was used to describe a wild stallion that had been broken by its master. Broken in such a way that that the stallion never lost its strength, but it was more useful now because the strength that the stallion had was now under control. The fourth one that we see is in Matthew chapter five, verse six. It says, God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. Jesus is saying, blessed are those who live God's way, not their way. See, Jesus isn't talking just about sin in this moment. He's also talking about purpose. Another kind of heavy question is this, is is in your life right now, are you... Are you on God's team? Are you trying to get God on your team? I don't know about you, but I've found myself on the latter half of that plenty of times. And what Jesus is getting at here is the, the team that we choose to live on makes the difference in the kind of life we experience. That at the end of the day, we can't have the promises of God and the pleasures of this world at the same time. And how many of us live our lives that way? How many of us kind of attach these these pleasures and these desires of things that we think is going to make life happy, but yet all the while we're wanting God's blessing and promises in our life and And then if you're anything like me, you've pursued some of those things. And then when you didn't get them, you blamed God, right? I mean, that is our human nature. And Jesus is having this moment with these disciples. And he's like, listen, if you're going to experience all that I have for you, all that I've created you to live, that you've got to choose my team, not your team. I'm not really a big fisherman, but Here's what I know about fish is you get them out of their habitat, you get them out of the water on the dry dry ground and they start kind of flapping around, right? And suffocating. Eventually they will die because their oxygen doesn't come from the oxygen we get, it comes from the water. And what happens in our life is when we start living life our way rather than God's way, we end up removing ourselves outside of the habitat in which God has created us to live. You see, it's almost like kingdom living is upside down living. There's the things of this world that make sense to us, but what Jesus is trying to help us understand in the sermon, the small group teaching, is that what you think is going to help you thrive, what you think uh, is going to make life better and is going to lead to happiness isn't 
because you're going to be like a fish out of water, suffocating in life, asking questions. Why, God, does things keep happening the way that it's happening? All because God never created us to pursue those things in our life. God created each one of us to pursue him and to pursue his kingdom and full and fulfillment and complete happiness is always found in the things of God, not the things of this world. And Jesus is just, it's just like, it's such an amazing picture of how he's sitting here before the disciples and all of these people are out there and he's trying to help them see that everything that these people are pursuing and going after and thinking is going to make them happy isn't going to lead to happiness. Jesus is having this moment. He's like, listen, I know it don't make sense and I know it's uncomfortable, but if you want happiness and fulfillment, you've got to choose the Jesus way. The fifth one in Matthew chapter five, verse seven, said, God blesses those who are merciful for they will be shown mercy. Jesus is saying here, blessed are those who demonstrate compassion to others. And the reason why I use the word demonstrate is because this word compassion in the original language isn't just a feeling, it's feeling coupled with action. I mean, how many of you know it's one thing to feel compassion, it's a whole other thing to act on it, right? See, compassion is when our heart breaks because somebody else's heart is breaking, And when we have that kind of heart posture in our life, it does something. Like it changes us. It it begins to cut off some of the rough edges around our life and our attitudes. Jesus mentions the sixth thing in Matthew chapter five, verse eight. He says, God blesses those whose hearts are pure. For they will see God. The sixth one, Jesus says, blessed are those who have an undivided heart. See, this word pure in the original language means without contaminants. In other words, it means those that are striving to live the kind of life that, that resists the things in our life that we know are gonna contaminate our relationship with God that if we want happiness, if we want to be blessed, if we want to have fulfillment in life, that we've got to live in such a way that we kind of, that we begin to resist those things. And maybe for somebody here today, maybe the reason why you feel like you're suffocating in life is because, is because there's a part of you inside that loves God, but the other part is so in love with the things of the world that you keep allowing those contaminants into your life. And you're walking around in your life and, and you're addicted to this or you got this issue or that issue or, or this heart issue and you're wondering why it just seems like you can never get beyond where you're presently at in life and, and could it be one of these moments? Could it, be, could it be this? Could it be that for you today, Jesus is calling you into this kind of relationship with him where you begin to resist some of those things end your life and have an undivided heart. Matthew chapter five, verse nine. says, God blesses those who work for peace for they will be called the children of God. In other words, blessed are those who are peacemakers. How many know there's a difference between a peacemaker and a peacekeeper? Jesus is clear that his calling on our life is not to be a peacekeeper, but to be a peacemaker. What's the difference? A peacekeeper is somebody who who walks on eggshells in their life or their relationships because they they don't want to upset somebody. They tend to keep their feelings to themselves. They tend to apologize for things that were not even their fault and Oftentimes what peacekeepers will do is when conflict arises in a relationship, they will exit the room. 
what a peacemaker does is they wade into the waters of the conflict and with love, they try to bring restoration and unity even at the expense of their own comfort or relationship. And Jesus, I mean, imagine what's ahead for these disciples and even what's ahead for Jesus. I mean, ultimately, that's what Jesus did as he was a peacemaker. He brought peace into a broken world and he's called us to bring peace into a broken world. And then the last one, which I'll tell you, if I was writing the Sermon on the Mount, I would have seven points, not eight points, because I don't like this one at all. But in Matthew chapter five, verse 10, the eighth heart posture that Jesus shares with these disciples, he says, God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. I do find this somewhat interesting when you think of this idea of upside down living when it comes to the kingdom of God, that oftentimes in our lives, if we were all being honest, like our goal, our striving is to to live a life that's absent of conflict. It's absent of difficulty. And what Jesus is saying here is that, that, listen, happiness and fulfillment comes despite the difficulty and the pain and the conflict in our life. He says the eighth one, that blessed are those who are mistreated for doing right. I think it's important to point out here that biblical persecution isn't accountability or punishment for doing the wrong things, right? It's not... Persecution is not us going out and sinning and doing wrong things and then experiencing the consequences of that and all of a sudden we're being persecuted. The persecution that Jesus is talking about here is when the times that we do the right thing, but it's the hard thing. And in those times where we walk away and we're like, we did the right thing, we did the hard thing, but yet everything else is coming against us That is persecution. And friend, I wanna give you this kind of nugget today that you and I are never more like Jesus than when we're walking through persecution. We're never more like Jesus. And so today, wherever you're at, like if you're in a season where it feels like you're doing the right things, you're doing the hard things, but, but it just, all hell just keeps coming against you. I wanna encourage you in this, that you are never more like Jesus than in the season. And I think that's why Jesus feels the need to unpack this eighth one a little bit more in verses 11 and 12. Here's what he says. He says, listen, God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. And then watch what he says in verse 12. It goes completely contrary to anything that we would think in this world or what life should be. (laughs) He's like, be happy about it. He's like, guys, when you're persecuted, people are mocking you, they're lying about you and all hell is coming against you for doing the right thing and the hard thing. Jesus is like, be happy about it. And then he says this, like, not just be glad, but he's like, be very glad. But why? For a great reward awaits you where? In heaven. See, I think this whole small group that Jesus has with these disciples in this moment is trying to help them change their perspective from changing their situations here on earth to focusing on heaven. You see, maybe that's 
Maybe that's some of our biggest struggles in life. Maybe we struggle to choose Jesus' way in these areas. Maybe more times than not, it's because our focus is down here rather than up there. Like his promise is that all of this is gonna pass away at some point. We're told that we are foreigners here. Like this is not our home. That we were created to spend eternity in heaven with the creator of the universe. And when we try to focus to make this place our home, where this place becomes our happiness, we begin to suffocate in life. This is such a powerful moment that we see here with Jesus. That Jesus is along the hillside and and he sits down. And I can just, I can just, picture this moment. Like, I don't know who you would identify most with in the crowd. Maybe you would identify with yourself as one of the disciples that are sitting around Jesus and he's sitting down and teaching. Or maybe for some of you today, maybe for some of you today, you're the crowd. And you're here today just because you're just kicking the tires of like, man, life's going the wrong direction. I don't really know what to do or where to go, but I kind of heard about this guy and I heard about this place. And, and if so, like, we love you. You're welcome here in this place. And I don't know where you would identify with in the crowd or around Jesus' feet, but, but I can see in this moment that Jesus is here and these disciples are gathered around and some of the crowd is probably starting to kind of drift up the mountainside and some of the crowds down kind of drifting away. They're there to kind of see the signs and wonders and maybe they're chasing after the emotionalism. Maybe they're just there to see how Jesus can make their day a little bit better, right? And then there's some. That they've heard about this Jesus guy and they're just kind of they're just kind of pushing in because they're like I want to I want to hear more. I want to learn more. And Jesus looks at these disciples and he's gazing over their heads at these people that are coming in and I can just picture for Jesus that he's looking at these people and he's not just seeing who they are now, he's seeing the world changers that they will become. Some of these people around Jesus' feet are gonna be martyrs for their faith. They're gonna be people that experience a persecution, not like in America where we burn our popcorn because it cooks too long but a kind of persecution where they give up their life for their faith. Jesus looks at them. Again, doesn't see who they are, sees who they will be. And he looks at them and he says, guys, gals, there's a better way look at this crowd and you look at the culture that you live in and your desire is to go after them. Don't choose your way, but choose Jesus's way. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's message, be sure to share it with your friends and tag us at TransformTLH. Thanks again for listening, and we look forward to seeing your face in the place someday. Have a great week.